Let's have a, a lesson and discussion on this piece and follow the lesson for free and pick up all the tips. But if you're interested, I do have a sheet music edition of all 25 etudes in Carcassi's Opus 60, and there's a link for that in the description. So etude number one uh, is, a, is a great opening etude for the collection. Uh, it has a little bit of everything. It's, it has scale work, it has some arpeggio work, it has shifting, and to some extent, it's it's kind of like the meat and potatoes of, of guitar playing. So he puts that fourth right away. But there's also some interesting um, markings in the music and uh, and some, some significant challenges too. So we'll, we'll be discussing those. So it is marked allegro. So that's fast. Um, you can play it at whatever tempo is, is suitable for you. The interesting thing along with that is his marking of staccato. And the staccato marking is, is interesting because, you know, you can only play so staccato in scale runs when it's when it's allegro. So I consider that marking more of just like a slight detachment and a slight straightforwardness to the to the lines, uh, mixed with the uh, allegro tempo, so that you end up with something that's like a little bit punchy, rather than like. You know, something that would be like, you know, really like contoured and smooth. He marks it staccato and, and you know, the character of the opening section of this etude, until it starts opening up with with more exchanges, you know, it's it's fairly like straightforward, which is one of the reasons why these Carcassi etudes are so beneficial ped pedagogically. It's because they are, are so straightforward that you can really work um, a student's technique within, within a musical context, but you know, straightforward enough that like you can really get down to some good teaching and good studying with these pieces. Because when he presents scales, it's scales. When he presents arpeggios, it's arpeggios. When he presents a, a slur study, it's it's gonna be a lot it's gonna be all slurs, like very pattern oriented. So great teaching pieces and study and great etudes. There are a couple of ways that we can accomplish that detached um, staccato marking that that he mentions. And again, I don't think the intention is like a strict staccato on each note necessarily, but it really depends. Um, there are three ways that we can go about this. Um, in terms of the right hand, I think like a preparation, a pre-preparation on the string. You know, when your finger plays a note and then the next available finger touches that string, that mutes the sound. However, in this particular etude, because it's descending scales, the next available finger often is on the, the, a different string, which can leave that open string ringing out. But another way is that we can, in the left hand, when, when we play a note, of course we can lift the pressure off the note, and that stops the sound. That detaches it, right? Now, if we lift our finger completely off, we sometimes risk um, like a pull-off sound. So if, if we just release the pressure but keep our finger lightly on the string, um, that stops that extra note from ringing out. Obviously a combination of these two things together um, uh, accomplishes the staccato. Now it's the open strings that cause a particular problem in this piece 
when you're doing those descending scales. And that's where a, a subtle muting of the strings or touching of the string with the left hand, you know, comes in handy. But again, I'm going to emphasize that students at the early intermediate or even the intermediate level, muting all of the open strings might be beyond um, the scope of your studies at, the, at this time. Um, more, you know, the late intermediate students or more advanced students, um, you can definitely attempt to, to mute out everything. I think for a lot of students, just, you know, a slight detachment of the feel without too much concern about some of the ringing notes, you know, is just fine. You just kind of play through it. If some notes ring out, that's kind of okay. Just make sure you're muting those bases where indicated. If you're a little bit more advanced, you can, you can attempt by a combination of those three methods to, to really get a kind of more detached, punchy sound out of those, those scales. So um, I think we can pretty much do a run through the piece, but like, you know, that vibe of the opening um, does change a little bit as it goes through, you know, especially when you enter There's some two voice playing in piano. I, I find that uh, the, the section that can have a little bit more emotional content. And then he dives into some fairly challenging arpeggios. And they're challenging in, a, in only a certain way, but we'll be talking about ways to practice those. So I, I think we should just go through the piece, though. But that's a general vibe of the piece. And so for the opening, I have all the fingerings marked in my edition, but I do choose to go P, A, and then finish with M, I. So the first exchange, because it's so far away, I do with A. A, M, I, M, I, M, I. So it's essentially... The jump happens with A and then scales with M, I, or I, M. And I, I do that for, for pretty much the whole first section. Now the other interesting aspect of this opening is that the bass, the bass notes should be muted at the rests. So when you strike that B, get your thumb back on that fifth string to mute that bass note. Uh, I think that's, it's tied in with the staccato articulation that everything's like a little bit tighter, a little bit more closed. Now, when you hit this one, you'll find that if you hit the E, that you're still gonna have a sympathetic E ringing on the sixth string. So instead of muting the fourth string there, I mute the, I put my thumb on the sixth string and release my left hand finger from that E, which mutes the sound much better. As opposed to, you know, that that E keeps ringing in other strings. So rest your thumb on the sixth string if you really want to cut that, that low E there. Let's continue from bar five. generally tend to like play that one of the low sixth strings with my thumb but then I'll always switch back and measure nine there I'm using an open string to facilitate the shift and here I'm playing the first note with my thumb because it's so far away from the fingers thumb but then just right I am fingering at measure 13 I, I used to finger it differently I used to go use the open string as a shift and play in third position but you know really I think most students can do that little bit of a stretch also with the texture being just like slightly detached um, you don't have to like you know completely I like, do the whole stretch you can pretty much just shift down weirdly switch down and then or make sure you <laughs> reorient your hand into a good position uh measure 13 i'll just do it again all 
those passages, you know, just it's an arpeggio. And then, so like T-I-M-A, and then you just am I for the scale, right? Thumb. That's always bothered me a little bit at 21 and 22 where um, this is cross strung. But, you know, if you detach the, the D sharp a little bit, I kind of don't worry about it, though. I just try to play the second one as legato as possible. Um, it's, you can't get too picky with this stuff. And then I like to do a little bit of a, of a rip there. Sorry. sweeter through this section um, which you know has a little bit of counterpoint or a little bit of two voice playing uh, and just you know you do a little bit of a writ and then you set it up make it kind of cute and charming but it breaks out of that and goes back to the original texture pretty quick I play that with my second finger just because I, I find the reach easier students may wish to use three and two instead it's up to you, whatever you're comfortable with. Okay, the arpeggio section. This is probably the most challenging part of the piece. It gives students the most trouble. Um, I would practice it in three ways. So the first way I would probably recommend is just practice it in block chords really slowly. So just take all the notes within the half note. Just learn the shapes. I memorized it just from doing it. So first just learn those shapes and become very confident just getting the whole shape. The second thing I like to do is much more practical in terms of how to play the piece is you get the bass note first then the rest of the chord. Because when you're doing these shifts, you don't really have time to grab the whole chord at, at faster tempos. You must just grab that bass note. So you're just focusing on getting that bass note, and then you have lots of time to get the rest of the chord. Do that with a metronome and do it at a faster tempo than you would actually play the piece. Get really good at getting the bass note that gives you a split second to get the rest of the chord shape into your hand. Then when you actually go to play the piece, uh, the most practical thing is to get one note at a time, but really again I, I let that bass note guide me through it. You can see that, you know, I'm grabbing just the bass note first, and then I'm, sometimes I'll get one note at a time, or, you know, I'll get a couple of notes at a time, but, uh, or was it? It's almost impossible not to clip the upper note sometimes, but we'll talk about that. Because of the shifts and because the final note is is uh, on the first string there, you have to hold on to it to the last possible moment. But again, melodically speaking, you know, there's going to be some, you can't sustain the notes, you know, across the measure or something because you, you literally have to shift your hand away. So, you know, on a micro level, it gets clipped a little bit. But if you're letting the bass line guide you through this section, then it's not that noticeable because our attention is on the sustain of that bass note. And we just try 
trying to get as much as we can out of that top note, but but keeping that bass sustain going just helps keep the listener and yourself just focused on on playing through and getting some legato out of the passage. Um, well, because other voices are just are not going to be as legato so really focus on that bass line try to practice every once in a while with a real sostenuto on that top note or like a fermata on each one just to get used to getting some length out of it and then you do the best that you can but but those th those three ways of practicing the chord shapes i think are, are really important they set you up for the success of faster tempos so then we arrive at 37, being a little bit playful with the octave of the bass note. And then a dramatic ending. So in, in some ways, pretty straightforward little thing. Scales, scales and arpeggios. And there's one little two voice section that's like four bars long. But scales and arpeggios, that's the first etude. That's what he wants to get your playing in order so that when he starts doing more complicated textures, um, that, that you'd have like solid playing under your fingertips. In many ways, though, I really consider it's called progressive, uh, progressive um, etudes, progressive studies, but I do consider number one to be quite m more difficult than a lot of the etudes in the book, but I guess that would depend on your strengths and weaknesses, but certainly at faster tempos it is. Uh, but in regards to tempo, you know, I really think that your focus on the first etude should really just be solid playing not tempo. I, I took a fairly quick tempo there because it says Allegro and I've played this piece a lot of times and I, I've never played it that quickly before but I, I felt like in this case um, I wanted to push myself a little bit with the, the tempo so go much slower uh, and just relax and have solid playing, solid musicality and really get this under your belt and then if you if you feel like practicing it long term and bringing it up in tempo you can do that um, I've played this for years, I've taught it many times to students, but I just never raised the tempo. I never really paid attention to the Allegro marking because you can only play the piece as fast as you can handle the different textures. Um, but as I, as I started having more fun with the piece, um, preparing for the video, I, I decided to pick up the tempo a little bit, which means, which is really great because the etudes can benefit, you know, students at the early intermediate level, or it can benefit very advanced students, depending on the tempo. It's hard to play this particular piece really cleanly at faster tempos. So that was my, my little challenge for myself there. But everyone's challenge is going to be different. Lots of people are just going to be really working those chord shapes to see if they can get them solidly at any tempo. So great little etude, a great teaching piece. I often give this to my students to clean up their playing and to test their skills out at the intermediate level.